the military situation in the Persian Gulf this morning. He has also uh, turned us over at one point to Lieutenant General Chuck Horner on his left there, who is, as General Schwarzkopf describes him, the architect of the air campaign. Do you know how long it takes us to get rid of this trouble from the Gulf? Uh, that, that's an impossible question to answer. I would tell you that nobody is more dedicated to getting this over as quickly as possible than the President of the United States. Uh, than the people of the United States, and then I, and then all of the other people involved in this thing. So we're going to do it as rapidly as we possibly can, but we're also going to do it in such a way that we try and minimize casualties. We don't want to have to pay a terrible price just to get it over with quickly. Back in the back. Uh, Saudi source told me that 192 out of the first 1,000 air sorties were flown by Saudis. Can you confirm that, or is that of military? Uh, that I can't confirm or deny that number, but that's approximately right. Yes, Can you tell us uh, uh, what proportion of your assets you've so far been able to devote uh, to attacking Kuwaiti ground targets as opposed to a mixture of targets in Iraq? And can you give me one technical answer? Are the mobile launchers you're talking about all basic SCUDs or are they the uh, Iraqi developments of the SCUD, the Al Hussein, the Alabas? Okay, I, I don't think the first question I'd like to get into. The second question is a combination of both. Over here, yes. Can you tell us what the role of the Canadian planes were? The uh, Canadian planes right now, CF-18s, are flying uh, uh, counter air, air defense and capping both uh, over sea and over land. Since when are they uh, in, in, the, in the operation? Uh, well, they've been in the operation from the start flying air defense uh, for the uh, coalition forces <coughs> and the kingdom, right from since they got here. All the way back in the back. Jeff and Lars, you may wish to meet. General Warner, you pointed out that one site that was attacked by the F-117. In general terms, can you give us your impressions as to how the aircraft is performing? A follow-up question, were all the images we saw taken from F-111s using the laser-guided bombs, or were there different platforms that were uh, uh, involved in the uh, the images, uh, the first two were 111s, and the rest were 117. I can tell you the F-117 is, is doing great. You'd think I was a prejudiced witness. But uh, quite frankly, you see the evidence of what it can do and uh, is doing day in and day out. Richard. Uh, I'm Richard Pyle of AP. General Horner, uh, how many of the aircraft that we have lost have been lost to enemy, enemy fire? How many to missiles? And what is the status of the Iraqi... Uh, air, any aircraft missile defenses now. This is uh, supposedly a high priority target system. Can you uh, give us something on that? The, uh, in terms of losses, we don't know, but uh, we suspect one the SAMs and the rest of AAA. Uh, with regard to the uh, air defenses, in some areas uh, they're probably the most uh, difficult air defenses assembled in the world. Other areas, uh, they're not quite the, that difficult. And obviously that's going to be a very uh, uh, strenuous campaign achieving uh, complete control of the air. The AAA to which the general refers is anti-aircraft, uh, conventional, not missile attacks on aircraft from the ground. Uh, once you get on the ground, once you get forward, who is going to do the actual fighting in the, on the Allied side? Is there a special focus on the Arab units to do that? Uh, this, uh, you know, this is a coalition operation, and everybody that's involved uh, in this coalition is, is planning to take part. It's just as it has been from the very beginning. Yes. General, can you give us your best estimate uh, of Iraqi casualties, military and civilian, at this point? I, I have absolutely no idea what the Iraqi casualties are, and I, I yeah. tell you, uh, if I have anything to say about it, we're never going to get into the body count business. Uh, that's. Uh, at best, uh, uh, nothing more than rough, wild estimates, and it's ridiculous to do that. And so uh, we couldn't do it even if we wanted to, but right now we have no estimate whatsoever. Back to Mike. How is your cooperation with the French Army? I mean French Air Force. The cooperation with the French Air Force and the French Army is absolutely superb. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, General Paul indicated yesterday that one of your principal objects was the destruction of the Iraqi command and control. Can you give us some estimate as to how far down that line you've, you've, you've gone? Um, I think to date, uh, you know, we have been quite successful. I wouldn't have a good time. Yeah. I to follow up to that question, but a little broader. 
H how is the coordination of the various forces actually working? Could you give us a little insight into that? Well, I, I, I think I'd let General Horner answer that from the standpoint of the air campaign because this is, as you can well imagine, coordinating the nations of seven different uh, seven different nations and coordinating the airstrikes and the type of aircraft that are being used is a rather difficult uh, proposition. Uh, whether it's effective or not, I will leave to him. Uh, it's effective. <laughs> no, you can say that. But my question, sir, was exactly how is it being done? I mean, it's, uh, it's it, it seems like an enormous effort. And it is an enormous effort. It's, uh, of course, now we have a lot of computers, and, and you can bring together the tens of thousands of minute details, radio frequencies, altitudes, uh, tanker rendezvous, uh, bomb configurations, who supports who, who's flying escort. Uh, who's all, there's just uh, thousands and thousands of details, and we work them together as one group, put them together in what we call a common air tasking order, and it provides a sheet of music that everybody sings the same song off. Yes, sir. We know something of what's happening in Baghdad, but we know very little of what's happening inside Kuwait. Can you give us any uh, picture of uh, what you're attacking and uh, how it's going in Kuwait itself, around Kuwait City? <coughs> Uh, I, as I said, I think the best answer to that is it's going just about as we expected. We haven't run into anything that we didn't expect. As a matter of fact, the situation is probably a little bit better than what we expected inside Kuwait. Yes, sir. Can you tell me, is it the case that as long as Iraqi troops remain in Kuwait, a ground offensive will be inevitable at some stage, regardless of the success of the air operations? I, I think there's too many hypotheticals in there to even begin to answer that question. As I say, we have a campaign plan. We're going to follow that campaign plan until we accomplish the objectives set out by the United Nations resolutions and as announced by the President of the United States. That's our last question right here. You got uh, it. With regards to the bombardment of Khafji uh, yesterday, General, um, have you any information on, on the type of Iraqi artillery that was used and roughly the force uh, strength? Yeah, the, the, the estimate was that it was a multiple rocket launcher the short-range multiple lock rocket launcher that we've seen used by, by many uh, uh, third country forces. And as you know, what it did was just hit one oil storage tank and didn't do any significant damage. I'd just like to close with one last comment that I think is important to remember, and that's that uh, the, the courage and the professionalism that's been exhibited by all of the people that have been involved in this campaign in the last 36 hours is, is nothing short of inspirational. I think that we should all be very, very proud. Every country should be very, very proud of the young men uh, that have been up in these aircraft, of the young women that have been up in the aircraft and the way they've done their jobs. And I have every confidence that uh, as they gain more experience, they're just going to do better than the great job they've already done. Thank you very much. Thank you, General Fort and Lieutenant General, Fort General Horner Chuck and Horner, and the two men most responsible, responsible for the thirst. 37 hours of this campaign, and more importantly, from a military point of view, uh, most responsible for the preparation of this. You heard General Schwarzkopf at the beginning of that briefing give uh, enormous credit to General Horner uh, for bringing together the multitude, or as General Horner said, the 10,000 pieces of information uh, which is required to keep a largely U.S. Uh, dominated, but certainly a coalition um, of forces up in the air. In terms of the coalition, one of the things we do learn this morning is that the Canadians and the Italians have been uh, flying along uh, with the U.S., the British, the French, and the Saudis. It is confirmed that in the first thousand sorties, uh, they are now, according to General Schwarzkopf, flying about 2,000 a day, but in the first thousand sorties of all kinds, um, the Saudi Arabian Air Force flew about 192 of them. It's difficult in a briefing like this to get a complete uh, grasp uh, of the scope of the operation, but we do have with us this morning uh, people who are uh, much more learned than most of us in terms of trying to analyze what the general and what the generals have said and what they have not said. So let's go quickly to Washington um, and get this ball rolling by listening to our resident uh, military analyst, Tony Cordesman. Tony Cordesman, as you listen this morning, what do you think you're hearing in terms of sort of overall tone? Well, I think it's one of almost complete confidence. We seem to be moving very, very quickly through the first phase of this battle, which is the suppression of the air defenses, the air capabilities, the command and control, even the SCUD missiles. 
I think we are beginning to move now toward the next phase, which will be air attack in detail and maneuvering for the air land battle. The only area that has been left as a gap so far is how well we can do against the Scud launchers in the west of Iraq. But system after system has worked, and Peter, one great lesson of this, as in 1982 in the Bekaa Valley, is that it takes very high technology forces to give the United States the kind of edge it needs. We've heard technology after technology listed, and they all seem to have worked with remarkable success. Not only that, the people behind them have done an amazing job at every conceivable level. You talk about, let me just quickly fill in there a little bit, you talk about 1982 in the Bekaa Valley. I think you're referring to the uh, domination by the Israelis of the Syrian Air Force using American aircraft and American technology, am I right? Well, and of course, Israeli technology, but not only that, what was incredible was their suppression of the surface-to-air missiles. And there the key was not that any one technology worked, but a combination of people and perhaps 10 to 20 technologies gave them an overwhelming edge against the numbers that Syria had. Just a first impression from you on the videos that General Horner showed us of, uh, of the cameras in the noses of the aircraft. What was your impression of the, of the bombing he showed us? Well, when I think back to what I used to see in Vietnam, it was absolutely incredible. I had seen photos like this in terms of research and development activity, but to see this in operational combat we are at least 10 times more effective today than we were in Vietnam. It is an incredible performance. Okay, we'll get that video together for people uh, in a fairly tight and compact way so that they can have a look at it again. Uh, but perhaps uh, the most, uh, uh, the most uh, what is it, surprising uh, to some people attack was the one on what General Horner says was his opposite numbers headquarters, the headquarters of the air defense for Iraq in Baghdad. Uh, which appeared to go at least right into the center of the building and blow the sides out in some considerable measure. Now, ABC's Jim Hickey is standing by in eastern Saudi Arabia. Jim, you've seen some of the pilots coming back from their missions this morning. Yes, that's right. In fact, uh, I've been watching uh, many of the Marine pilots return from a base, uh, return to a base in the Persian Gulf. Weather is becoming a factor in eastern Iraq and in Baghdad. It's becoming a factor in this uh, Desert Storm mission because most of the planes returning this morning were coming back fully loaded. They still had their bombs attached, still had their missiles attached, had not com accomplished their mission. Pilots tell me the reason is the weather is, is too bad, it's too cloudy for them to see the SAM missiles being fired at them. Uh, we talked about the electronics and the avionics and the plane and couldn't that be enough to handle the problem. And uh, the pilots say they can find their targets uh, electronically. That is not the problem. It's in, at the final result. Uh, the one pilot says in the end game, uh, evading a SAM missile is a matter of maneuvering around it or man outmaneuvering a SAM missile. And he says in order to do that, we have to see them. And uh, we can't see them today. So instead of uh, taking an extraordinary chance of being shot down, uh, they have returned, uh, the squadron commanders ordered their planes back to the base where they landed safely, and uh, that mission will be called up again in the future, but not today. Uh, so weather is becoming a factor in the air war now. General Horner also says there has been, he emphasizes restraint in all these missions uh, so as to avoid civilian targets uh, at any cost or at most cost. Is that the kind of attitude you get from pilots as well? Absolutely. The pilots are telling me that they are, uh, they have specific missions, specific targets that they're going after. Um, most of those targets they can find electronically, but if they can't, uh, they do not uh, fire their uh, weapons at targets of opportunity. First of all, that's not their order. Uh, it's a surgical strike, and they are to hit only their targets. Uh, and secondly, as one pilot said to me, these missiles cost too much to waste on targets of opportunity. Uh, some are up a half a million dollars each. So if they can't find their target, uh, they will not shoot, they will return loaded. There was that one question to General Horder, Jim, about whether or not uh, the Iraqis had been fairly passive, and he said, I'd like to take you on a mission to change your mind. When you talk to pilots about the quality of the Iraqi defense at this point, 37 hours after the campaign began, what do they say? Many of them are surprised that the uh, quality of the defense is not better. They say there is a lot 
being shot at them out there, especially in the first hours. Uh, many of these pilots had never been in combat before, uh, and uh, they were told what to expect, but they came back uh, absolutely astounded by the amount of anti-aircraft fire, what they call AAA, being fired at them. But they're also surprised at how inaccurate it is and how ineffective it is. And now, part of the reason is that they are outflying that uh, air defense, those air defense systems, by staying above it. Uh, but also, uh, they also think that they have been pretty effective in the beginning at striking at Iraq's uh, the military command and control centers, because now in the last few hours, overnight and into this morning, they they tell me that uh, the, uh, the air defense seems disorganized. That uh, what is being fired at them has no pattern anymore. That it seems as though gunners are just firing into the air with no direct uh, command from any superior organizations or officers. So they think they've done a good bit of damage to uh, command and control centers in Iraq. And that's exactly what General Horner said and General Schwarzkopf. Thank you very much, Jim Hickey, in Riyadh this morning, and show that one piece of video. Um, an attack on the headquarters of the Iraqi Air Force just on the edge of Baghdad uh, to reinforce uh, their intention to go after the command and control center. It's been a prime target since the very beginning. And as I recall General Horner's words, uh, they had done a pretty good job so far, uh, though it has not been completely eliminated. Uh, the total number of aircraft which apparently have been shot down, that is to say, overall, is seven Allied aircraft, three U.S., two British, one Kuwaiti, and one Italian. The French took some damage in the early stages of the campaign, and eight Iraqi planes have been shot down. The Iraqis have a mixture of French and Soviet aircraft, the MiGs and the Mirage, of uh, various designs, Soviet MiGs, French Mirage. And you hear there from General Horner that in some cases they have engaged, and when they have done so, they have tended to be knocked down. In other cases, as soon as there's a radar, lo radar lock on, he says, Iraqi pilots have tended to break off and fly north. That would be deeper into the Iraqi heartland, uh, up towards uh, the northeastern part of the country, which of course would put them out of the range or out of the easy range of American fighters who may have been lingering over targets and may have a fuel problem. Now the information war is heating up again this morning. Let me give you a couple of examples. It has been uh, reported um, on uh, the basis of a couple of sources, one French and one coming out of South Lebanon, that the Israelis had launched um, at least a measured attack against uh, the Iraqis this morning, which is to say that they had launched, uh, according to reports from South Lebanon and the French news agency Agence France Presse, two flights of four aircraft each, a total of eight aircraft, which took off in the direction of Iraq and flew apparently across Syrian airspace. Very quickly, the Syrians have come on the air uh, to say that they deny that completely. If there are any Israeli aircraft in the region, they have not flown across Syrian airspace. That may be accurate, may be a natural uh, political reaction from the Syrians who would not want other Arab nations to think that they've allowed their airspace to be used. Baghdad Radio uh, has come on the air this morning and said in the same uh, subject that the Israeli warplanes have taken off and flown to Saudi Arabia today to join the U.S. dominated multinational force in the Gulf and the clear intention, not to be totally cynical about it, the clear intention there by the Iraqis uh, will be to try to cast this now as a coalition which is Israel and the United States fighting Iraq. In the Gulf, in uh, ABC's Mike Lee has been uh, monitoring the information war from there. Mike, what can you add to all this? Uh, Peter, I'm afraid the latest news from uh, Iraqi Baghdad is not very encouraging. Uh, Radio Baghdad uh, quotes uh, a number of officials to do with, uh, connected with the missile batteries that hit Israel last night as filing a uh, report in a telex to Saddam Hussein and that Saddam Hussein sent a message back and again I quote Baghdad Radio, Saddam has asked them to continue hitting strategic targets in Israel. Now we don't know uh, specifically uh, whether or not uh, Baghdad uh, Radio can in fact, they have not confirmed uh, the report you just mentioned about Israeli jets taking off in the direction of Baghdad. We do have, as you said, that report that the Iraqis are suggesting a lot of Israeli jets have gone to Saudi Arabia. This is very much in line with what they've been doing over the last couple of days, trying to cast this, as you say, as um, 
the Israel and United States against the Arab world. I've spoken to a number of uh, Muslims here in the lower Gulf this morning. They're very upset about the whole situation. First of all, they're upset at Saddam for putting him in this position, but they say that once it starts, once Israel is militarily involved, then all bets are off, and there'll be a massive sentiment to uh, Saddam, at least uh, to side with Saddam, if not militarily, at least politically. Which is precisely, Mike, you've got a lot of time in that region, which is precisely why Baghdad Radio this morning may be reporting that the Israelis have taken off to join the multinational force, whether they have or not. Indeed, and it's certainly in their interest to say that. There may be a lot of disinformation in this area. As you know, uh, Radio Kuwait uh, in exile said yesterday that the Iraqis were fighting amongst themselves inside Iraq. It's hard to know what to believe, but uh, we cert that this, beyond a doubt, Saddam is at least making the outside world believe that he intends to fire more missiles into Israel. Okay, anything else from your neck of the woods, Mike? Well, I get a, just a sense of talking to people here. Uh, I've gone to a couple of mosques this morning. I've met people coming and going. It's a good place to monitor reaction among Muslims throughout the world because there are a lot of foreign workers here from Islamic countries in Asia, Africa, the Far East, as well as the Middle East. And almost to a person, they said, look, we didn't really want Saddam to hit Israel. This raises the stakes. But once it happens, it puts us in a very difficult position. And I think many of us in the West, uh, for us, it's hard to understand that kind of mentality. But the anti-Zionist sentiment runs so deep that, uh, and, and the peer pressure here is so great, and it runs so far back in history that it's very difficult not to imagine uh, at least a number of demonstrations in Islamic countries around the world, if not riots, uh, at least those might be in politically unstable areas. But I think we're in for a long, long um, anti-American uh, sentiment if, uh, in fact, Israel does become involved. Okay, Mike Lee in the Gulf, thank you very much. One of the things that has concerned us overnight has been the, uh, the whereabouts of ABC's Gary Shepard, who left Baghdad last night uh, by road uh, to travel to Amman in Jordan. He has now arrived, we're pleased to say, at the ABC News Bureau in Amman. Uh, good morning, Gary. It's very nice to see you. It's the middle of the afternoon there. Why don't you just tell us how it's going? Tell us about your trip to start with. Well, good morning, Peter. Uh, it was a grueling 24-hour trip uh, getting here from Baghdad. We left the Iraqi capital yesterday afternoon about uh, 3 o'clock, uh, driving west uh, from Baghdad toward the uh, Jordanian border. Uh, on the outskirts of the city, uh, lots and lots of uh, Iraqis trying to flee the capital, uh, thumbing rides, uh, piling onto trucks and cars, and generally driving out of the city. Later, as we get out further on the highway, we saw uh, a number of Iraqi military vehicles, convoys carrying uh, uh, SS-20 uh, uh, Scud missiles uh, on uh, mobile launchers, and uh, SAM-6 missiles, those are the surface-to-air missiles uh, designed to uh, knock down uh, uh, American aircraft. Uh, we drove for hours and hours uh, after that without seeing uh, an awful lot, and then finally when we got close to the Jordanian border, perhaps about uh, 150 miles away, we had to turn off to a town uh, called uh, Rutba uh, for, to refuel. We were running out of gas, and by now it was uh, 9 o'clock in the evening, uh, pitch dark. We get to Rutba, and an air raid uh, siren goes off. Uh, we are in, in line at this gasoline station, and all of a sudden the sky just lights up like a Christmas tree, uh, an intensive uh, air attack by the Allied forces, and uh, we didn't realize it because it was dark, but we were apparently in the center of an awful lot of anti-aircraft batteries. And so the, uh, uh, the tracer rounds were going up, uh, you know, within perhaps hundreds of yards of us. Uh, this continued for a, a good uh, half hour or more. We were uh, later uh, told by uh, a local resident that there was a major Iraqi air base right near there, the largest Iraqi air base uh, in that part of Iraq, and the, uh, the airstrikes obviously were going into, uh, into that area. The uh, bombardment continued, uh, as I mentioned, for uh, well over half an hour. The blackout lasted for two hours. We were stuck there. They shut down the gasoline station. Uh, no power to pump gas. Finally, we managed to get uh, our tanks refilled, uh, got back on the main highway toward the Jordanian border, and uh, on two more occasions, uh, another incredible air bombardment uh, lighting up the sky. It was just like a Christmas tree. Uh, we had to pull over and stop uh, during uh, the attacks. Uh, on the second occasion, we got underneath 
uh, a highway uh, overpass for a little bit of protection, and Flack was landing on the highway in front of us, perhaps 50 yards in front of us. We were very, very fortunate not to have been hit by it. Gary, let me stop uh, you. Gary, <laughs> apologize. I want Thank to hear you. the whole story. I just want to interrupt you a little for a second there at Rutba where you stopped uh, because there's been uh, enormous concentration while you've been traveling on that particular area because it is in that area uh, from where it is believed the Iraqis fired those missiles on Israel last night while you've been traveling. Tell us again how intense was the attack on the area or could you only tell there was outgoing? No, we could uh, we could hear the the bombs uh, falling in the distance. Uh, uh, Rut Rutba is probably uh, not more than uh, 10, 15, 20 miles from the airbase. Uh, at least that's what we were told. Uh, you could hear uh, constant bombardment. We saw uh, great uh, white flashes of light, and uh, on several occasions, some great big, huge orange mushrooms where bombs were hitting. So that, uh, that was one of the more intensive attacks that we've seen. Okay, so now like, get us onto the border and give us the scene at the border, and then we'll get to the video you brought with us. Back to the border. Um, we got there about midnight, and it was closed. We were not allowed to cross uh, last night. Uh, there were perhaps uh, five, six, seven dozen trailer trucks all backed up on the highway, and uh, several hundred uh, private vehicles, cars and taxis and, and small trucks. Everyone stuck there overnight. This morning we woke up and, uh, and managed to get through Iraqi uh, immigration and customs uh, and we got right, right to the border and as we were about to cross, uh, more airstrikes. Uh, now we're talking about uh, 9, 10 o'clock this morning, uh, off in the distance in that same area uh, uh, around the, the Rutba region. So I just have to assume that those uh, attacks on, on the major Iraqi air base are continuing uh, today. Okay, Gary, uh, take, 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 take a breath for just a second because I just want to remind people that it is from Gary Shepard. We had the first news of the bombing attack on Baghdad the other day that was he who described the quite extraordinary scene which we subsequently saw in some of the video which we managed to get out of Baghdad last night. Now, Gary, I know you brought some video with you again today. Um, can you now run it for us and talk about it as you do? Uh, I think we can, Peter. Uh, okay. I don't know if I can see it right here, but I will uh, well, crouch down. Describe. Crouch down if you want and get closer to the monitor, um, and we'll uh, we'll run it. That, ah, by the way, goes. is the Jordanian skyline there, and. Uh, so you and Fabrice Moussas, who is a superb cameraman, has worked for us for years. Talk about it, Gary. Gary Shepard. Gary Shepard. Yes, but uh, uh, Peter, can you hear me now? I can, Gary. Is my so audio coming through? It's okay. absolutely, absolutely perfect. Okay, terrific. Uh, this, these scenes were shot on the first night of the attack when, uh, when it began just before 3 o'clock in the morning in Baghdad uh, from our uh, ABC News office in the Al-Rashid Hotel uh, on the right near downtown Baghdad. Uh, and, and, and all that uh, white uh, stuff you see going up, those are the tracer rounds from the anti-aircraft fire on the ground. There was a big flash from one of the uh, uh, bombs. Uh, we are told also cruise missiles were used that night. Uh, sometimes it's hard to tell, but this this is uh, uh, one of the most intensive attacks uh, in in uh, recent warfare. Uh, hundreds and hundreds of sorties uh, flying over Baghdad that night. It lasted uh, at least for three hours, uh, uh, not ending until practically dawn arrived. And uh, the areas that were hit included a major telecommunications tower. Uh, that uh, accounted for most of the international phone uh, uh, traffic in and out of uh, uh, Iraq, uh, as well as uh, the palace and other strategic areas that uh, the Allied forces were trying to hit. Uh, we had this sort of scene uh, from our hotel window uh, constantly, uh, although there were occasional uh, uh, slow periods, uh, but uh, on and off for, for uh, the whole night, starting uh, just after 2.30 in the morning. Uh, the, the sounds of the explosions in the distance. There, there goes another one now behind that uh, the silhouette of that tower that you can see. Uh, the, the bombardment just went on and on and on. And it was, of course, difficult for us to assess what was being hit. 
As it turned out, uh, many of the targets were uh, in the suburbs of Baghdad, where uh, many of the mi mi uh, military installations were, and so all we could uh, notice were the flashes on the horizon and uh, the sound of the bombardment. And as you can see, it just went on and on. It continued uh, uh, for just up until dawn when finally the air raid ended. Uh, I might point out that during the early uh, period of, of this initial attack, uh, Baghdad did not have a blackout. Uh, the street lights were still on, and I think you can probably see in some of these uh, sequences uh, street lights and perhaps even uh, street traffic. Now this looks like uh, uh, somewhat later in the evening when they finally did manage to get most of the ground lights out. And uh, I might also mention, Peter, that we are using a special night vision lens. We were using that uh, night vision lens to get these pictures. It enhances the uh, the view because, after all, this did occur in in, in uh, the middle of the night, and except for some ground fire, there uh, rather ground lights, there there was no light in the sky at all. Gary, just pause uh, for a second, if you would, uh, just to remind our viewers at eight o'clock Eastern time who were just joining us for Good Morning America that this is our continuing coverage of the Gulf War, and what you're looking at, if you've just turned on your television set, is the video recorded by. ABC cameraman Fabrice Moussis uh, from the Al Rashid Hotel in Baghdad during one of the American attacks uh, on Baghdad, and there have been at least several. It is now uh, 4 o'clock in the afternoon in Baghdad today, and ABC's Gary Shepherd, who was there during this initial assault, has just left the country uh, and has arrived safely in Amman in Jordan. We are pleased to report and is describing these pictures to us. There has been, uh, since uh, you went to bed last night, a briefing from the Allied commander in the Gulf, General Norman Schwarzkopf, and his uh, Air Force commander as well, General Chuck Horner. They say the campaign is going just about as well as they expected. In fact, they allude to the fact that in some cases it's going actually better than they expected. The total number of aircraft shot down, the latest figures, perhaps since you went to bed last night, are seven Allied aircraft three U.S., two British, one Kuwaiti, and one Italian, and all pilots are deemed to be missing with the exception of the Kuwaiti, who we're told it may well be in the hands of the Kuwaiti resistance inside Kuwait. Eight Iraqi aircraft have been shot down by U.S. forces. Let's go back to Gary Shepard. Gary, just keep talking about your experience, if you would, as we watch this video. Well, Peter, it was uh, obviously a, uh, an incredible experience to witness what happened because it happened without any warning whatsoever. Uh, at one point, uh, as you well know, I was, I was standing by on the telephone uh, uh, with the, your broadcast uh, that night, and uh, the sky was dark, and all of a sudden it just came alive. It was almost as if someone had set off a million firecrackers all at once. And uh, for the first few minutes, it was hard to believe that we were seeing this. And then as, as it continued, uh, it became very, very apparent that this was the uh, initial assault in the uh, Persian Gulf War. Was there panic in Baghdad? Well, uh, we, we couldn't leave the hotel, so we, we, uh, it was hard to judge, but uh, there, there were still vehicles moving on the street. There are a few right there, as a matter of fact, uh, in, in that picture. Uh, I don't know that they, they knew what was happening. I think it took Baghdad by surprise. I think the people were in a total state of shock by morning when they realized that uh, the war actually was coming to, to the uh, Iraqi capital. They had been speaking for days and weeks prior uh, to the beginning of the war uh, in the kind of uh, tones, and I'm talking about people on the street now, not just the government uh, pronouncements, but uh, the people had been speaking about uh, they want peace, uh, they don't want war, and they didn't think the war was going to come there, that somehow uh, it would have been avoided. Okay, Gary, pause, if you will, for a second, because we're going to... Uh take a station break here at three minutes after eight o'clock eastern time this morning but then we will go on with our continuing coverage of the gulf war which is now in its 37th hour we'll review what general norman schwarzkopf had to say about the campaign in saudi arabia this morning and ask our military analysts to see if they can understand the scope of battle as a result of what they've been hearing we'll be right back <laughs> War in the Gulf. When news really matters, it really matters where you get your news. ABC News, monitoring the war and the world 24 hours a day. Hi, I'm Kenny 
Tommy Loggins and my special friends here are preschoolers at Crippled Children's Society. To me, the best music of all is the sound of happy children. And these kids are happy because they're leading more independent lives thanks to Crippled Children's Society. For kids with physical, speech, and learning disabilities, the Society's many services give them a chance at a better life. Please join me in celebrating Crippled Children's Society's 45th anniversary. Volunteerism. It means many things to many people. To seniors, it means help in understanding health insurance, rides to appointments, house cleaning or house repair, nursing home advocacy, a hot meal, or just a friend to talk to. I'm Ricardo Montalban asking you to join me and volunteer today. Call your agency on aging to find out how. Announcing the San Jose Symphony favorite classic series, Thrill to Rossini's William Tell Overture. Verdi's Triumphal March from Aida. Gershwin's Rhapsody of Blue. Seuss's Stars and Stripes Forever, and much more. For your free brochure, call the San Jose Symphony, 288-2820. Good morning, I'm Peter Jennings at ABC News headquarters in New York on this January the 18th at a little after 8 o'clock Eastern Time, a little after 4 o'clock in the afternoon Baghdad time. There's been a lot going on uh, while you have been sleeping. We've had a briefing from the Allied Command in Saudi Arabia. We'll get to that in a moment. ABC's Gary Shepherd has just returned from Baghdad with a description of what's been going on, not only in the city, but along the way. And we've been looking at his video. Things are beginning to come alive in Washington as well. Let's briefly check in with the White House and Ann Compton, and tell us briefly, if you will, about the President's Night. We don't have Ann Compton at the White House, okay? I, okay, I have a list of people here who I think we have available to us. Okay, let's go to the State Department then, and David Ensor, and David, bring us up to date on anything you know there overnight. Well, Peter, uh, here at the State Department, they're obviously uh, following very closely the reports uh, of the attack on Israel by Iraqi jets, by, by Iraqi missiles. And the report that uh, you mentioned uh, earlier that, of course, cannot be confirmed in any way here, uh, that uh, there may be an Israeli counterattack underway. Uh, w basically, the effort at this building, and, and it was, uh, it w it was uh, represented best by Secretary of State Baker's call late yesterday to Prime Minister Shamir, is to, in the first place, try to convince the Israelis not to counterattack, uh, because that might damage the, uh, the delicately built, carefully constructed alliance against Iraq, but secondly, if the Israelis do decide they have to attack, to convince the other members of the alliance uh, that they should uh, put up with that and stay in the alliance and uh, see this thing through against Iraq. Okay, thank you, David Insur of the State Department. Reports that Israel actually has uh, launched an attack against the Iraqis has already begun to stir the political waters rather violently in the Middle East this morning. We've had a couple of reports that the Israelis have in fact launched an attack. Uh, two flights of four aircraft each having flown, we're told, out of northern Israel by the Agence France Presse, the French news agency, confirmed to us by one source on the island of Cyprus, but don't believe anything is necessarily confirmed in the Middle East these days. And almost instantly, Baghdad radio went on the air to say that the Iraqis were really flying, to, uh, the Israelis were really flying to Saudi Arabia, trying to uh, engage the attention of their supporters that the Israelis and the Americans are now going to fight them. And the Syrians have quickly denied a report uh, that the Israelis are going through e Syrian airspace on their way to Iraq which they might have to do, but would not necessarily have to do. Let's see what we know in Israel. ABC's Bill Siemens is on the line. Bill. Well, Peter, we've been pressing the military spokesman for some sort of answer, and his answer is the standard one, that Israel does not comment or answer any question about any military movements. Now, a lot of Israeli planes have been in the air these past few days. We've been hearing them every hour, and they've been flying what is known as a CAP, a combat air patrol, keeping a constant uh, protective umbrella over Israel. Uh, as far as the rhetoric involving uh, a possible retaliation is concerned, Avi Pazner, whom you know is the Prime Minister's spokesman and very close to what's going on in the Prime Minister's office, uh, said today that, uh, raising the rhetoric a notch, I would say, 
uh, said today that uh, dealing with a man like a murderer like Saddam Hussein is a kind of law of the jungle and when you are attacked you must respond and there is no question that Israel will exercise its right to legitimate self-defense. And then uh, when we asked Avi Posner if retaliation by Israel would hurt that uh, sensitive U.S.-Arab alliance, uh, Avi Posner claimed that it would not cause any rift in the alliance because he said uh, the Arabs fighting with the U.S. are more interested in getting rid of Saddam Hussein than in what Israel does. Now, Peter, as you know, Avi Posner directly reflects the deliberations in the Prime Minister's office, and uh, all day today the Prime Minister has been meeting with his top ministers and top military men to discuss that question, retaliation, yes or no. Okay, Bill, and undoubtedly there's been very close contact, at least at this point, with the State Department and uh, particularly with the White House. We'll try to catch up to that as the morning goes along. It's a little after 3 o'clock in the afternoon in Israel, a little after 8 o'clock Eastern Time in the States. Bob Zelnick at the Pentagon with information. Peter, uh, uh, beginning with the attacks against Israel last night, there was uh, constant uh, diplomatic contact between uh, Israel and uh, members of the Bush administration. At one point, as we reported, the Israeli embassy was in fact informed that one of those missiles that hit uh, uh, Tel Aviv was a chemical uh, warhead that was later, of course, uh, disproven, but that uh, uh, complicated the discussions for a while. At the end, the Israelis made known uh, their displeasure with the fact that uh, the early U.S. preemptive attacks against the Scuds were not completely successful, and the Israelis even felt that not even the stationary Scuds had all been taken out. The United States then added extra sorties to its uh, bombing program uh, of last night and said specifically that it would go after those Scud missiles. Now, based upon uh, what General Schwarzkopf said uh, at the uh, uh, press briefing earlier this morning, uh, the United States uh, has uh, located uh, uh, at least uh, 11 of the uh, uh, mobile SCUDs. My information is that of Iraq's 33, 36 SCUD launches, at least 15 of them were mobile. So if indeed six have already been taken out, and uh, five others are located, that's a fairly good percentage, but no final word, and indeed no word yet, that uh, the mobile scuds that have the western portion of Iraq, which is of course of greatest concern to Israel. Okay, Bob, let me just uh, just uh, give that a slight overlay from General Schwarzkopf, who said that uh, there has always been some disagreement uh, among military analysts and even among military intelligence officers as to just what the Iraqi uh, Scud capability was. But here he is, what he, here are his words this morning from the briefing he gave to the international press in Riyadh. He said, as far as he could tell, that the Scuds against Israel had had insignificant results uh, in military terms. I think he may be speaking not in emotional terms. Uh, the good news for him was that there was no chemical component uh, to that attack, and he hoped the Iraqis, if they still had a chemical component, would continue to resist using it. And in terms of the scuds, the mobile scuds we're looking at, and I think we can show you a picture of one of those, in terms of the mobile scuds that were found this morning, the good news was for him that they had found them all aimed at Saudi Arabia. They have all been destroyed. He then went on to say that there were eight more in the same location which are currently being attacked. Three of them, he thinks, have also been partially destroyed, and he then said that they will go on attacking the Scuds as long as weather permits. As you look at that picture, this is a big truck uh, with a missile on the back of it, and what happens is it just, it's like one of your kid's toys, it just sort of comes up off the back and can be pre-positioned fairly quickly, and because it is on a truck, uh, is just that much more difficult, obviously, uh, than a fixed Scud missile in terms of trying to locate it. If you look at the upper side of the picture, you'll see that they travel very quickly. One of our military analysts, Tony Cordesman, told us last night, you, the best place to get them, of course, is on the ground or in the very early stages of their flight. After that, they are very hard to hit. Though one was hit in eastern Saudi Arabia last night by a missile from the American Patriot defense system, which the Israelis also have, uh, but did not apparently deploy. In eastern Saudi Arabia, having, I beg your pardon, in central Saudi Arabia, Having listened to the briefing this morning, Barry Dunsmore, what can you add, Barry? Well, Peter, I was taken by a couple of things that uh, were said and were not said. In terms of what was said, uh, General Schwarzkopf made the observation, uh, noting the, the famous fog of war line by Clausewitz, 
Uh, he said that there had been some fog, but uh, not nearly as much as was expected. And when you consider the extraordinary complexity of yesterday's attack and the many, many things that could have gone wrong, it's really quite a good thing that there wasn't much of a fog of war, and that seems to be one of the reasons for the success. It clearly was a very well planned and very well executed attack. The other thing that I uh, noted that he didn't say was he didn't say a thing about the attack uh, on Israel, at least in terms of its implications for him, uh, for the coalition, and for the entire effort. Clearly that is a very important development, but he wouldn't touch it with a 10-foot pole. That's clearly something that's got to be decided in Washington and elsewhere. But I think both you and I know that it is an issue that has to be considered and dealt with. I happen to think that as long as the Israelis don't go too far overboard, that there is some some attack, some response commensurate with the attack on it, then things will be all right. If there is a massive Israeli attack on Iraq, it certainly could cause problems for the coalition. Okay, Barry Dunsmore in Iran, thank you very much. There's certainly no question that Saddam Hussein went overboard to pick up on Barry's words last night. Though if you look back to the early analysis, the pre-war analysis, nobody will be particularly surprised at this. Saddam Hussein always said if he was going to be attacked, one of the first targets would be for him, Israel. And part of the problem for a great many people yesterday was there was almost uh, lulling into a sense of false confidence that the war was going so well that Saddam Hussein was completely on defensive until the uh, action last night at about 7 o'clock Eastern time when those missiles were fired into the area between Haifa and Tel Aviv on the Mediterranean coast and you have been aware at least of some of the political ramifications in the time since then. We do not know precisely what the military ramifications are of it yet. Let's go back to Good Morning America and Charlie Gibson. Thank you very much, Peter. Uh, we have been monitoring Peter and obviously the uh, news conference that was held in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia by uh, General Norman Schwarzkopf, who is the uh, commander of all of the coalition forces on the situation in the battle so far. Obviously, the other story of major import, the situation in Israel, the landing there of the Scud missiles last night, the seven Scud missiles that hit in Israel. And I am sitting here with Richard Murphy. He is former Assistant Secretary of State for Near East, for the Near East, and a fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations uh, here in New York. Let me ask you the situation as regards Israel. We have been talking all morning long about whether they would retaliate, whether they would not. The considerations and the kinds of deliberations that are going on now inside the Israeli cabinet. What do they have to weigh? Well, the fact that they, uh, that they didn't preempt in the first place is a sign of the trust they have placed in the United States because doctrine would have uh, impelled them to try to cut out such a threat uh, before it could be used against Israel. Now uh, they have to weigh against a long history of Zionist doctrine that uh, no one is to defend Israel except Israel itself. They're going to depend on their own resources. What cost is it going to be to them to appear to be delegating their defense to the United States or to anyone else? Um, Barry Dunsmore raised a question a moment ago, which was interesting and I think something that's been in all of our minds, which is there a response by degrees? Is there, for instance, an opportunity for them to make some kind of a restrained response as opposed to some kind of all-out uh, attack that they could launch? Well, just how all-out an attack it could be in strategic terms, I think, is questionable. But, uh, again, Israeli practice, in my experience, has been that it's, it's not really an eye for an eye. You've got to take several eyes out for one eye uh, in their planning because that's the way you drive the message home. Don't trifle with Israel. Don't, don't walk on us. Uh, you're going to get hurt far worse than anything you can do to us Israelis. So they would reserve to themselves the time, the place, and the degree of retaliation. But generally, it is disproportionate retaliation to what, uh, what has hit them, be it a terrorist attack or a military. We had a, a chance uh, earlier in the day to talk to Avi Posner, who is a, a senior advisor uh, to Israeli Prime Minister Shamir, and he really raised the letter, uh, the uh, level of rhetoric in all this. Uh, perhaps we'll have a chance to play the tape later on, but he said it is really the law of the jungle at this point, and it mitigates for some kind of a response. Uh, is that for internal consumption? In other words, is there some kind of internal Israeli a political audience that you have to play to, or is that absolutely their feeling? Well, they're very concerned to keep up the morale of the Israeli civilians and Israeli military. But what it's doing, of course, it gets played instantly around the Arab world. You've got excitement in the streets of North Africa. You've got a uh, reaction from men on the street in Damascus. We're delighted. We're excited. He has hit Israel. 
there were some reports uh, from press agencies this morning, uh, specifically a French press agency uh, with a report out of southern Lebanon that there had been eight planes seen uh, going over southern Lebanon, perhaps into Syrian airspace, and then headed for Iraq. The Syrian radio was very quick. Uh, to deny that, and I and I noticed when you read that report, you sort of smiled, because I would suspect that the Syrian radio, the uh, Jordanian radio, everybody is going to be denying if there is an Israeli retaliation. Everyone is going to be denying that there. Mm -hmm. Very very the uh, embarrassing, and requires some response from them. How was it? Did we allow them in? Did we say it didn't matter if you came across our airspace? They can't tolerate that vis-a-vis -vis their own public in the Arab countries. We also have standing by in Washington uh, Phoebe Marr. She is a senior fellow at the National Defense University, has uh, joined us in the past this morning to talk, or in, not this morning, but has joined us in the past to talk about uh, these kinds of issues. Phoebe Marr, I would be interested to, uh, to hear your slant on whether or not you think uh, the Israelis uh, will respond with some kind of retaliation and what kind of deliberations uh, you think are going on there as well. Well, I think there are very serious deliberations uh, in, in Israel. Uh, I would wait to hear confirmation uh, of the retaliation. I was rather impressed by the statement of the, the Israeli ambassador last night, which indicated to me uh, that they might not retaliate. So until I actually hear that there's been retaliation, uh, I'm not going to uh, believe it, uh, so, so to speak. Uh, so we, I think we'll just have to, to wait and see. But like, like other commentators, uh, I think that the response from the Arab world is, is going to depend very much on the extent uh, of the Israeli response. Uh, this is certainly very serious, there's no doubt, uh, that it is going to intensify uh, anxiety, uh, anti-Americanism uh, all across the Arab and the Muslim world. But I do not think we should uh, exaggerate that. Well, uh, you, 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 it's interesting because you do, you do say that then, therefore there is uh, the degree to which they respond could become important. But I remember when you were with us the other day, you were saying that you felt that the Arab partners in the coalition were now so far committed to this that some kind of an Israeli response uh, to an attack would not drive them out of the coalition. Do you, do you still feel that's true as far as Syria is concerned? And well, uh, I did say that, and in fact that's what I was going to, to say right now, but I think we have to differentiate uh, among the, uh, the partners. It, se uh, I, it seems to me that the, the Saudis and the Gulf people are so far committed, and this is such a clear uh, national interest for them that it would be very difficult for them uh, to get out of the coalition. Egypt, uh, is a, the situation is a little more ambiguous, although Egypt has got a peace treaty with Israel, uh, and I think that unless the retaliation is severe, that they can resist it. Syria, of course, is the one that is the most uh, vulnerable, but perhaps the least, um, let us say, important to the military uh, effort. Steve Mar, let me take a break for just a moment. We're going to let uh, we're going to go to a commercial break uh, for a couple of minutes, and we will uh, give local stations a chance to cut away if they wish to do so at this point, and we will be back ourselves. Uh, with Richard Murphy and Phoebe Marr in just a moment. This special edition of Good Morning America continues. All right, how many this time? Eight cavities. Fourteen cavities? I didn't think I had that many teeth. You're going to have to drill? My parents are very upset. Parents today hope their kids won't have to go through what they went through. Luckily, today's kids use the toothpaste more than to strike a man, the crest. The first toothpaste clinically shown to give you protection down to the root of the tooth. Another great checkup. Yes. Woo, woo, woo. Later, dude. <laughs> Crest, the dentist choice, is the easy choice. Fun. Ever feel too clumsy some mornings to make a pot of coffee? Wake up to Maxwell House filter packs. Coffee blended with Colombian beans. Pre-measured in their own filters. Because better beans do make better coffee. No fumbling, no bumbling. You get a perfect pot every time. Maxwell House filter packs blended with Colombian beans. Because better beans make better coffee. There's a healthy frozen entree that doesn't taste like the box that it came in. This is it. Gene Shalit calls Awakenings a stunning motion picture. Have you thought what you'd like to do today? Everything. And Joel Siegel says it's a movie you have to see. Robert De Niro, Robin Williams, Awakenings, rated PG-13, now playing at a theater near you. Check newspapers for locations. Twenty-five minutes 
after the hour, or 24.30 after the hour, and we continue our conversation with Richard Murphy, former Assistant Secretary of State for the Near East and a fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations here in New York, and from Washington joining us is Phoebe Marr, Senior Fellow at the National Defense University. Let me talk to you a little bit about the situation in Jordan, both of you, and the situation for King Hussein. I was interested in two things. Number one, there have not been uh, many vocal demonstrations inside Jordan, and in any in the last 24 hours, but there was a rather strong statement in support of Iraq in the face of the kinds of military successes that have uh, existed for the coalition in the past 24 hours. Still, the Jordanians put out a very strong statement in support of Iraq. What is the situation in Jordan? How do they play this, and how do they now see their particular liabilities? Well, Jordan has a major relationship with Iraq. Jordan, in the strategic sense, has considered Iraq its prime defense against Israel. The Jordanians are intensely suspicious that the Israelis are looking for any opportunity, any excuse, as the Jordanians put it, to arrange for that final transfer of Palestinian population out of the West Bank, perhaps out of Israel proper, and uh, push them across the Jordan River. So uh, the king has had this feeling that the only defense he has in the Arab world is the might of the Iraqi army. But Phoebe Mark, given the kind of pounding that the government or the uh, entire nation of Iraq is taking, why at this point would the Jordanians be speaking out in support? I would think they would simply keep their heads down and keep quiet. Well, it, there's, a, there's another reason for that. Yes, I agree with what uh, Richard Murphy has said, and if, in fact, Iraq was a defense, uh, clearly that defense isn't going to be there uh, for very long. There's, there's another factor here, however. Uh, as we all know, that over 50% of the population in Jordan is Palestinian, and for reasons I think your viewers understand, there's tremendous support for uh, the message that is coming out uh, from uh, Iraq as, uh, in support of Palestinians. So King Hussein... Uh, faces pressures from below, so to speak. And as you also know, uh, Jordan is now a more democratic uh, regime. King Hussein must respond to that, and I think, in fact, uh, that he's done so very well. If survival of the regime, uh, and certainly that is uh, his major aim, is the aim of the government, uh, he must respond, uh, at least verbally, uh, to those pressures, and he has done so. And in the minute 15 we have left, let me ask you each to give me a quick comment on the kinds of pressures that must exist on Saddam Hussein now. The country is taking a terrible, terrible pounding. Do you anticipate he remains defiant and prosecutes as best he can this war for now? Well, I've, I have felt that uh, his uh, um, commitment to the war and his readiness to go into the war was A, because he wanted Kuwait, B, he uh, thought he could defend it or maul us badly enough that he could keep hold of it, and uh, finally that uh, he would uh, perhaps do as well in a war as in peace since he was convinced we were going to come after and try to destroy him. So now he's hanging on. He needs time. He wants to get the maximum time uh, in terms of uh, showing the world, and particularly the Arab world, that he has stood up against the mighty alliance, and in particularly against the United States. And he may be uh, conscious that if he, he certainly is conscious that if he does that for several days, he's going to have a quote-unquote victory in Arab terms. And a quick comment, I'm afraid we're out of time, Phoebe, from you. Yes, I agree. He's probably going to hunker down. He's going to try to weaken our position politically, and at least come out having salvaged his reputation as the quote-unquote hero of the Arab world. Phoebe Marr, Richard Murphy, thank you both. This special edition of Good Morning America continues. War in the Gulf. When news really matters, it really matters where you get your news. ABC News, monitoring the war and the world 24 hours a day. Hi, I'm Kenny Loggins, and my special friends here are preschoolers at Crippled Children's Society. To me, the best music of all is the sound of happy children. And these kids are happy because they're leading more independent lives thanks to Crippled Children's Society. For kids with physical, speech, and learning disabilities, the Society's many services give them a chance at a better life. Please join me in celebrating Crippled Children's Society's 45th anniversary. Volunteerism. It means many things to many people. To seniors, it means help in understanding health insurance, rides to appointments, house cleaning or house repair, nursing home advocacy, a hot meal, or just a friend to talk to. I'm Ricardo Montalban asking you to join me and volunteer today. Call your agency on aging to find out how.
announcing the San Jose Symphony favorite classic series, Thrill to Rossini's William Tell Overture, Verdi's Triumphal March from Aida, Gershwin's Rhapsody of Blue, Seuss's Stars and Stripes Forever, and much more. For your free brochure, call the San Jose Symphony, 288-2828. Assessing the U.S. strategy on day two of Operation Desert Storm. And good morning, everyone. I'm Charles Gibson. And I'm Jen London with a special edition of Good Morning America. It is Friday, January 18th, and we are bringing you extended coverage of the war in the Gulf along with Peter Jennings in the newsroom. The world is waiting now to see if and how Israel will respond to the conventional missile attack last night by Iraq. The United States, of course, is urging Israel to show restraint, and Syrian radio has categorically denied the reports that Israeli planes were heading toward Baghdad. And over their airspace. The other story, obviously, the assessment of the military situation inside Iraq and Kuwait after the uh, more than 36 hours now of poundings by coalition bombers. The Allied commander, uh, General Norman Schwarzkopf, held his first briefing since the war began this morning, telling reporters in Saudi Arabia that Allied planes we're running about 2,000 missions or sorties every day, and he says they are running at better than 85% effectiveness. Another thing, obviously, of great concern, the mobile Scud missile launchers that were considered to be responsible for the attack last night on Israel. He said they have found 11 of those mobile Scud missile launchers inside Iraq, and they have attacked them, uh, destroyed at least six, and he said the attacks will consider, uh, continue on the others. This morning, from us, we'll have an analysis, obviously, from the military angle, but first we do go to Peter Jennings, who has the latest from the Gulf, from the newsroom. Peter? Thank you, Charlie. Let me pick up on that scuds immediately, because in General Schwarzkopf's briefing, highlights of which we'll show you in just a second, he pointed out that the scuds which have been located are all in an area from which they could only reach Saudi Arabia and not Israel, to get that clarified as quickly as we can. And as you will hear... Uh, from General Schwarzkopf this morning. This is not Panama, he said. This is not going to be over in a day. So in the 38th hour since the U.S.-led campaign against Iraq and occupied Kuwait began, we will have an assessment. I must tell you that the um, number of Allied losses has gone up slightly. There have been seven Allied aircraft now lost, two more American for a total of three, two British aircraft, two British tornadoes, one Italian, People surprised a little bit overnight to know that the Italians were flying combat mission and one Kuwaiti, though we're told that the pilot of the Kuwaiti aircraft is safe or presumed to be safe in Kuwait, according to General Schwarzkopf, in the hands of the Kuwaiti resistance. And according to the briefings from Saudi Arabia this morning, eight Iraqi aircraft have been knocked down and you perhaps will hear something in this highlight package, uh, which we now play for you from central Saudi Arabia. Uh, where the briefing was given this morning. This is General Schwarzkopf and also Lieutenant General Chuck Fowler, or should I say Harbert, Howard, who is the Air Force commander, the man who really put this air campaign together. We are flying a total of about 2,000 air sorties of all types each day. Uh, more than 80% of all of those sorties have successfully engaged their targets. The sorties are being flown by the United States Air Force, the Navy, the Marines, and some Army. Uh, we also have six other nations that are involved with us in this coalition. Saudi Arabia, uh, Kuwait, the United Kingdom, the Canadians, the French, and the Italians have all participated in the air campaign to date. Uh, to date, we have lost seven aircraft. Two United States Navy aircraft, one F-18 and one A-6, one Air Force F-15, one Kuwaiti A-4, two British tornadoes, and the most recent one was an Italian tornado. Uh, what I have now to show you are some film clips of some actual weapons delivery. So let me come around here. And uh, these first two will be F-111 deliveries using laser-guided bombs. This is the runway at an airfield halfway between uh, Baghdad and Kuwait. The center of the runway is the end point. 
This is where the uh, laser designator is pointed. This is taken at night with infrared sensors. And there the bomb goes off in the center of the runway. And heat shows up as white. And now you'll see the uh, pilot switch to a higher magnification and uh, as he flies away from the target. This is the smoke plume from the bomb, and there's the crater. The next one is a Scud storage uh, building in uh, Kuwait. And keep your eye on the uh, entrance to the storage. Again, the uh, pilot has released his bombs about two miles away. He's banking away from the target, leaving the target area, blazing the target. And you'll see two bombs fly into the door of the uh, storage bunker. You can almost get airsick watching this. And you'll be able to count each bomb. One, two. Those are 2,000 pound bombs. 